Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Harry Cliff. His book is Space Oddities, The Mysterious Anomalies Challenging Our Understanding of the Universe. It was published by or it is published by Doubleday, and it was released uh, just last week. So Dr. Cliff is a particle physicist. He's based at the University of Cambridge, um, but his research mm, about which this book really is concerned takes place with regard to an experiment called the LHCB, um, the B being for beauty. We can discuss why it's beauty. Um, at CERN's Large Hadron Collider, he was a curator at the Science Museum in London for several years. And uh, as many of you may already know, he gives lots of lectures and um, TV and radio appearances. The 2015 TED Talk, Have We Reached the End of Physics, which we've, he and I talked about briefly before the show, has been viewed by well over, I don't know, three or four million people. And his first book was How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch, which was about three years ago. And people might think, oh, what kind of title is that? And that harkens back to Carl Sagan, which is if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you have to start with making the universe itself. Um, so hi, Harry, welcome uh, to the show. Hi, Sam, good to be here. So it's funny. Hey, do you ever read your comments like uh, on the YouTube Royal Institution, Institution Talk? I do sometimes, I, ha I have done in the past, but it, it's, it's an interesting place to comment feed underneath anything really because you get a kind of mixture of some quite nice things that people say and then some really weird things that that people pick up on as well <laughs> yeah mine are uniformly horrible they one guy goes, <laughs> the interviewer talks so much why doesn't he just interview himself and so <laughs> i replied and said yeah that's a great idea um, <laughs> but no the reason i ask is because uh if you weren't married this would be pretty good because well, I can't say anything politically incorrect because this one woman who comments on you is very attractive. But she says, um, she goes, her name is Missy Marie, 1637. <laughs> she goes, they're all upset because you're giving these really good jokes, but the Royal Institution is so staid, you know, they don't laugh at your jokes. And she goes, oh my God, he has such a big twinkle in his eyes and his humor fell on deaf ears. And then she goes, oh, my God, same. It makes me want to make out with him. <laughs> I mean, I I never went into physics thinking that would be a way of attracting a girlfriend, to be honest. I, I mean, it's funny, actually, that because I've, I've seen that kind of comment that people aren't laughing. But in the Royal Institutions, this is a big venue in, in London where actually I just launched the, the most recent book uh, the other day on Wednesday evening, but the microphones don't pick up the audience reaction. So actually, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I would say this, wouldn't I? But they, there is actually laughter. It's just that the mics don't pick it up. So the recording ends up feeling a bit weird and sort of deadened as a result. So you only hear me, you don't hear what's going on in the room. I turned up the volume to see if they were laughing, but you always, but the thing you do is you always make it seem like particle physicists are boring. You do it on purpose <laughs> in your talk. Um, do I do it in, in, in what way it, it, I come across as boring or I make fun of them? No, no, you boring. make fun of particle physicists, you know, this is, yeah. you know, oh yeah. When you talk about the discovery of the Higgs boson and, you know, they're, they're jumping up and down like they're at a football match, which particle physicists probably don't even know what football is. <laughs> I mean, that's a bit unfair. It's, it's, a, it's a cheap shot of my own, the sort of stereotype of my own field. But actually, you know, particle physicists actually now, it's, it's quite a diverse group of people. I think particularly because CERN is so international, there is a real mix of, you know, different nationalities. And, and a lot of people actually, I mean, I, I'm actually not, I'm not a football fan, really. But a lot of my colleagues are big football fans and know way more about it than me. So that's a bit of a, it's a sort of cheap laugh, essentially, that I was getting at the expense of what people think about physics. But it's not, those stereotypes are not entirely true, I think. Well, it's just like, with this show too, since COVID, so much of your stuff is virtual that you're getting, you're getting so many more people from, because they can't all fit at CERN. And, mm -hmm. and you get people from around the world that you otherwise wouldn't have the chance to interact with. Yeah. Same with, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, we were talking about reaching the end of physics or not. So let's, let's just take as an example, the sterile neutrino 
how's that working out for you guys? So, I mean, sterile neutrinos, uh, they, they come from lots of different uh, theories that kind of go beyond what we call the standard model of particle physics. Neutri maybe I should say something about neutrinos themselves, first of all. So neutrinos are, there are three of them that we know about in nature. They're a fundamental particle, and they are often referred to as elusive or ghostly or, you know, other sort of phantasmagorical sounding words, essentially because they don't interact with ordinary matter very much at all. They have no electric charge. And that means they have this ability to go through solid matter as if it was glass. So, they, you know, a neutrino from the sun will go straight through the earth and out the other side with no trouble at all. It's very unlikely to bump into an atom. Um, so they're very, very weakly interacting. But then there's a even more antisocial version of a neutrino called a sterile neutrino, which doesn't even interact through what we call the weak force. So this means it's basically completely cut off from ordinary matter. The only way it can have an effect is through gravity, which is fantastically feeble. So you know, basically these things cannot touch the physical world that we inhabit. But they are a solution to various problems. So, you know, the most, uh, probably the most, famous uh, solution problem they solve is, is dark matter. So sterile neutrinos, if they have the right mass, could potentially explain this, uh, you know, 80% of the matter in the universe that we don't know what it is, which is which is dark matter. So but they, they come up in various other theories. There is in, in space oddities that one of the stories in the book is about this weird anomaly in neutrino experiments where two different experiments in the States, one at Los Alamos originally and the other another at Fermilab, saw neutrinos appearing in an experiment where they shouldn't appear essentially and one of the popular explanations for this was that there was a sterile neutrino that was interfering with the way neutrinos behave essentially allowing these things to kind of crop up where you wouldn't expect to see them so you know there's some there's been evidence you know circumstantial evidence for them here and there over the last few years it looks like that hypothesis is sort of on the wane though like the most recent experimental results that looked for evidence of these sterile neutrinos didn't find find any sign of them. So, but you know the, the the concept itself is not dead by any stretch. But there's no real evidence that they they exist at the moment. Yeah, it's funny. Whenever I I don't know, it's like whenever I look at a book uh, that's written by say you or Max Tegmark or Ryan or going lower down the totem pole, even Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> um, I kind of go immediately go to YouTube and look at Sabine and and what she says is wrong with particle physics and why you guys are just speculative philosophers. And and then I read these comments about how I, I read a comment by someone who worked at CERN saying that you guys all diss her and say horrible things about her. <laughs> it's all that. I mean, there's there's a certain amount of infighting. I don't you know. But the reason why I listen to her is because I get another viewpoint. Just like you're talking mm. about on neutrino, there's these experiments, and then all of a sudden, eh, no, it doesn't look like that's right. So I'll yeah. just produce something else that fits in. Like our hero, Max Tegmark's hero, Feynman, he goes, you know, you have this theory, and it's beautiful. Like I just, I interviewed a guy who wrote uh, beautiful experiments. It's beautiful, but it doesn't quite work. So you tweak it a little bit, and then it works, but then it's totally useless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the thing, you know, people, Sabine has a particular point of view. I don't, I don't agree with most of what she says. I mean, she has some good points in some areas, but I think she has a tendency to caricature particle physicists as if we're sort of like a slightly cynical bunch who just make up, invent hypothetical particles, then get money to build experiments to look for them as if it's, you know, there are much better ways of making a living if, than, than just sort of wasting your time. The idea that thousands of people would waste their time looking for things that don't exist when they could go off and do something boring like finance, I don't know. I mean, yeah, so I, I, but much more financially rewarding. People do it because we, you know, we do it because we want to find out about the world. And there are different approaches to that. But I think one of the things that you know she misses is that physics isn't just about you know what theory tells you you should be looking for it's also exploration and what we're really you know we are at the edge of in any area of research you're at the edge of the you know, knowledge edge of understanding this kind of frontier of understanding and you're kind of grappling around in the dark really you're trying to find promising places where you might get a clue and you need a broad 
set of approaches to do that. So some of that is, you know, collider physics, like at the LHC, some of it might be dark matter experiments underground you might be launching you know other the other end of the scale you've got things like the james webb space telescope that's looking out into the distant universe so you have all these multi-pronged approaches to try to make progress and i think it's a, it's a bit easy to kind of just critique this oh you know didn't find what you were looking for etc cetera, etc cetera. if but the problem is you know until you look you don't know if these things are there or not and if you just stop looking then you're never going to find anything so yeah okay most experiments if they're looking for something that hasn't been predicted before, that's something new, they probably won't find what they're looking for, but one of them will eventually. And that's why we need this sort of breadth of approaches to physics. Uh, and I think that's why that kind of critique is not, it's not completely fair. And it's a slightly sort of straw man, I think, that it gets set up sometimes. Well, but if you could look at that, the, your standard model of particle physics, and, and you can define this in a second and say it's accurate, you've reached Six Sigma, and the chart looks really nice. And so if it's right to 12 or some decimals within a one in 500 million chance that it is chance. So then where is the missing part? And if the standard model appears to be complete, which is what you posited theoretically in your last, in that talk, then how do you edge your way into whether it's a graviton or a sterile neutrino. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why the standard model doesn't have like the positron and the antiparticles either. Oh, it does. It does. They're just, I mean, I think you, you may be thinking of this like sort of chart that I chart. show or other people right. show in the, the list of particles, but like we, we to, in order to not make it too messy, you kind of simplify it, but you only show the matter versions of the particles, but the antimatter ones are implied. So there's like for every quark, there's an antiquark. They are all part of the standard model as well. They're, they're, you know, that, that table is really just a representation of the list of particles, but there's, there's a lot more to the standard model than just a list of particles. There's a, you know, a, a kind of quite elegant mathematical framework that sits it's underneath all of this and describes how these things interact with each other and the way they behave. And so in a sense, yeah, it's true that the Saturn model is complete in the sense that we found all the particles we expect to find, but it's not complete in the sense that we don't, we haven't seen all the phenomena which it predicts. So for example, you know, one of the thing, one of the big areas of focus in particle physics at the moment is understanding the Higgs boson. So this particle was found, you know, more than 10 years ago now, but we still don't really know if it is actually the Higgs boson, as in the standard model Higgs boson, we've, it's like, you know, you've, you've taken a photograph of something from a distance, and it's slightly blurry. And it, you know, it, it's a bit like, I don't know, trying to take a photograph of a car on a freeway that's several miles away. And you know, is that a Ford? Or, or is that, you know, a kind of Renault, I, I can't quite tell from this distance, I can tell it's red, that's sort of where we are with the Higgs, we see that it's sort of lining up with our predictions, but there's a lot we don't understand about it. And that is one of the big targets of the well the large hadron collider's got another decade or so to run and it's you know a big job of my colleagues on atlas and cms these two big experiments is to sort of zoom in on the higgs test its properties to see if they align with the standard model because there's a very good chance that you know when we look at this thing more closely we'll discover that it's not quite the standard model higgs boson it's something a bit different and that will be that is one way of making progress and i think that's a sort of a general thing that's true about physics there's a a, a lovely um speech actually that I reference in the most recent book Space Oddities by James Clark Maxwell, who's one of the sort of towering figures of 19th century physics. He was inaugurating the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, where I work now back in the 1870s. And he said there was a similar view at the time. And he said this view has got around that the job of physicists is just to measure fundamental constants to the next decimal place. And he says, you know, basically, and the physics is basically sort of finished more or less. And he says, there's no reason to think this and you know we cannot presume uh you know the richness of creation essentially and even when we are just measuring things to the next decimal place you're laying the groundwork for the next steps that will allow you to make new discoveries so you know there's always this kind of there's all these different ways of approaching physics but one of them is to actually you know you have your theory you have your experiment you measure as precisely as you can your current theory, because often it's in the sort of last decimal place where you find something that doesn't agree. And that's happened repeatedly through the history of science, where a big breakthrough has come from what appeared to be some tiny little deviation in some decimal point. But then it leads to this profound new view of the universe. And that could well be true of the Higgs. It could be true of the standard model more generally. So that's why we spend so much time at CERN and at other places 
making these measurements as precisely as we can, because the purpose of that is to really test, is this theory a true theory of the universe or is it an approximation? And are we going to discover the place where that approximation breaks down? And that's where you make progress ultimately. I always think, you know, again, go, we always hearken back to Feynman, but I go back to his explanation of, you know, and which you've heard thousands of times of, you know, you're, you're trying to figure, you're an alien trying to figure out how the game of chess works. And you mm. think you have your standard model down complete. And then you're looking and all of a sudden you see the king and the rook move and you go, what the hell? You know, just like you said, you know, that's funny. That's not mm -hmm. the Eureka moment is that's funny. And you realize it's castling. But who would who would even think, you know? So, yeah, until you drill down and drill down and drill down and find that one thing. But then you have to verify mm -hmm. that you're not yeah. just... You're not just seeing uh, pigeons poop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the problem with, you know, all experimental physics. You've got these confounding effects and these experiments are often very complicated. So you may see something that looks intriguing. And, mm, OK, what's that? I haven't seen that before. But the first thing you've got to do is really convince yourself that this is a real effect and it's not, you know, some missed bias in your experiment or some statistical quirk or or maybe your theorists have miscalculated what you ought to be you ought to be seeing. And there, there's a great quote from Feynman, also from Feynman, which is the first rule is you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. And I think that's very true because scientists are so, you know, all scientists, I think, are keen to make discoveries. That's why you're in the game. You want to find out new things about the world. And so it's very tempting when you see some deviation to go, ah, this is the, this is the moment. This is my moment to make a big breakthrough. And that has led people astray many times through history as well. So you have to be, it's this mixture of sort of optimism, but also caution. You've got to be optimistic in order to carry on doing the experiments or, or making your theoretical predictions, but you've got to be cautious so that when you do see something new, you really do all the work to convince yourself and everyone else that this is a real thing and not, you know, something that's leading you down the garden path. Bring up. Uh bringing it back to the book, which is what we're trying to do is sell, sell the book. Yeah. Um, talk about the sealed envelopes so you don't fool yourself. That's really fascinating. Yeah. So this is a, a common practice now in, in physics and science more generally called blinding. So basically you're trying to measure some property of a particle. There's a, so to give an example, there's an experiment at Chicago at Fermilab called the muon G minus two experiment. And they are trying to measure or they are measuring the magnetism of a particle called a muon. And a muon is basically a, a heavy version of the electron. And the magnetism of the muon is a very interesting thing to measure because it's sensitive to the existence of new particles, new forces that we've never seen before. So their basic game they're playing is you make a really, really precise measurement of this magnetic moment of the muon, and then you have a theory prediction and you compare the two. And if you see a deviation, then that can be evidence of you know a new force of nature, for example. And going back into the mid 2000s, a, a version of that experiment carried out at Brookhaven on Long Island had indeed seen such a deviation. So this Fermilab experiment was built basically to either confirm or refute this previous result, because if it's true, then it's really big. You know, this is like a massive breakthrough. But so to prevent, but there's always this danger if you're, you know, you're designing your experiment, you're designing the way you and that you analyze the data, there are various choices that you can make. So if you imagine you could always see what the end result of the calculation of the, of the measurement was, you could kind of adjust the way you do the method to sort of shift it one way or another. So you have this thing where basically, uh, the they scramble effectively their data with it with an unknown cipher essentially technically it's actually the frequency of a clock that they use but that, that doesn't that's a technical aside so basically there's this process where two uh, members of the lab who don't work on the experiment go to this special room they set this clock to an unknown frequency they write the frequency down on in on two bits of paper they're sealed in envelopes and then one of them is sent to the university of washington to be kept safe another one's locked away in a safe fermi lab or in a drawer somewhere and it's only when the experiment has, you know, the experimental team, several hundred people have, you know, finalized everything. They've reviewed all their processes. Everything's been agreed. They're pretty sure it's right. That there's this moment where they enter the cipher and they unscramble the result and they see, you know, is this thing they were trying to measure, does it agree with the old measurement and is there new physics or is it, you know, going to agree with the prediction and the new physics goes away. And so there's this real dramatic moment of, you know, where you actually see for the first time is there something going on? And uh, so Chris Polly, who is 
the spokesperson of this experiment who I interviewed, and he described this amazing moment where he was basically sitting on Zoom in the control room. This is during COVID. So all his colleagues are all over the place, you know, at home watching on their laptops. And there's this moment where he puts the cipher in, the result comes out and it lands bang on top of the Brookhaven result from 20 years earlier. And they basically confirm this anomaly. And there's this huge, you know, a sense of excitement, you know, ex- you know, people whooping and cheering and applauding. And it's like this kind of quite a lovely moment in a way, because you've been working, a lot of these people have been working on this experiment for a decade, you know, devoting years of their lives to getting this thing right. And so seeing it come out, you know, where everyone hoped it would, it must have been really, really exciting, I think. A lot of what you talk about in the book and perforce in a book designed for lay people like myself is framed in metaphor. And so like when you look at the standard model, most lay people will think back to my elementary school days when this was all portrayed as a proton, a neutron, and an electron, and a little solar Mm -hmm. system, and they all revolved around it. And now the metaphor is so strange because, for example, with quarks, you know, they're not up, they're not down, they're not charmed, they're not strange, they're not top or bottom, or as you, you, your euphemism instead of bottom is beauty, you can explain that, but so what do we do with these metaphors i mean how are they created and what do they tell us other than just a simple label Hmm. well i suppose there's a there's a distinction between a label and a metaphor i mean a a label is just what we call the thing so you know we have these set of quarks as you say there are six of them they've got names the names are pretty arbitrary right they just you know that they're historic there's historic reasons why they have the names that they do so for example there's a some there's something called a strange quark and it's called a strange quark because they back in the 50s and 60s people started seeing particles that behaved strangely literally this thing isn't what we would expect to see so they called it strange and it became and it stuck so a lot of these names are just historic accidents or you know someone happens to pick a name and it sticks but in terms of metaphor i think that's more about you know when you're trying to create a mental image in the mind of the reader or the listener that allows them to kind of get some kind of intuition for what's going on. So, you know, I kind of, uh, a metaphor that I use quite a lot in the book, I, one of the sort of strange things about particle physics is that we don't really think of particles as fundamental in some sense, that f- particles are actually manifestations of these more fundamental objects called quantum fields, which are essentially invisible uh objects that fill the entire universe every square inch of or every cubic inch of space essentially from here to you know the edge of edge of space time and every particle is just a little vibration in these fields so you can think of the the metaphor i use over and over again in the book is you can think of these fields like fluids it's almost like a an invisible ocean and a particle is like a a a ripple a, a vibration in that ocean essentially now that isn't really quite right because these quantum fields are not really fluids they're not really like the the sea but it's a useful picture because it gives you something to hang on to that the problem is with so much of what you're talking about in physics is actually these things you're describing do not follow the rules that we are familiar with in our everyday experience you know when you get down to the quantum realm the quantum realm does not look like the ordinary everyday world and so all we can really do is try to create mental pictures that give you some sense of what's going on, but they're all wrong in one way or another. I think it's, um, I think Niels Bohr said something like when we're talking about quantum mechanics, we can only use language as in poetry. So it's about kind of creating these mental images or impressions, but not a sort of actual accurate description of what's really going on. The only way to get at that, unfortunately, is to go and do a physics degree and, you know, learn the mathematics. Uh, and that kind of shows you as close as we can what these things really are like. But for the purposes of a popular science book, you have to create something that's kind of visual, I think, to, to allow people to hang hang their kind of ideas on. Yeah, there's two good metaphors. Well, one, you know, again, Feynman, that, uh, you know, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand it. And the other one is the uh, story about you know, the two young fish swimming along in the ocean and and the old fish goes by and says, hey boys, how's the water? And then they swim on and one of the fish turns to the other and he goes, what's water? (laughs) Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because we don't really know what we're, you know, we're in air, but we wouldn't know we were in air unless you told me that's what this is. And so, yeah, so when you're talking about fields, it's hard 
hurts, it will hurt my head by the end of this interview to understand that we're not talking about particles at all. We're talking about this, as you said, fluid, where every once in a while, something kind of like a piano string just kind of tw twangs. And mm. then, I, you know, it's yeah. hard to yeah, yeah. wrap your head around. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's very counterintuitive because we, you know, the world around us looks solid. And the idea that everything we see is just like a little vibration in this, in this invisible thing that's all around us is, is very far removed from our experience of, you know, everyday life. But I mean, that's one of the, I think that's one of them sort of the magical things. I sort of hesitate to use that word a little bit, but in, in a sort of emotional sense about physics, that it tells you that the world is not as you see it, it's not as it appears. You know, the sort of world we live in is in an illusion in some sense created by these phenomena that are, you know, happening at scales so tiny that it's really very hard to imagine them. But they together give rise to this apparently physical solid environment. But all all of nature ultimately is the are these little vibrations like a ripple on a pond, essentially. Yeah. And it's like when you say magic, it's like, I guess it was Arthur C. Clarke going, you know, any technology advanced enough mm. is is equivalent to magic. And mm. that's where I think you guys have almost got to, which goes back to Max Tegmark explains it in a certain way, and you do too, the idea that the Big Bang wasn't really the kind of actual beginning of things. It was a representation of something that occurred earlier. Try to explain that if you can, because that's really a tough one. Yeah, so I think there's there's this kind of classic story of the Big Bang that got told for a very long time and still gets told actually, but it's sort of wrong, which is that the universe begins as this little point, it expands very rapidly, the universe is created, that's the Big Bang. And you know, you have a lot of hit light and matter and all the rest of it getting created in this rapid expansion. But that isn't really now the standard story of cosmology. There is this other thing that got added on in the 80s called inflation. And Inflation is basically the idea that in the very first moments of the universe, space time expanded exponentially. So that means that the, the distances between things grew at an absolutely phenomenal rate. So I, I think to give you a sense of the, I should get this right, but it, inflation, so this, this is a process that lasted for at least a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. We don't really know how long it lasted, but in that time, the universe expanded by the same factor that would take a period at the end of a sentence to something that was tens or hundreds of times bigger than our galaxy. So it's this like incredible stretching of the universe essentially that happened. Now, what that means is that because of this very rapid expansion, you have this very rapid expansion and then the energy that's driving this expansion, which is sometimes called the inflaton, some kind of force essentially that's driving this expansion, the inflaton decays and it, the energy, this vast amount of energy that's driving this expansion converts into matter, light, you know, basically the stuff that we find in the universe today. So you essentially have this inflating period where the universe is very empty, essentially, and, and then it stops and you get the Big Bang. So basically there's this thing before the Big Bang, which, which is this rapid expansion of space. Now, the, the thing that means we don't really know if there's a beginning or not is that we do not know whether inflation just you know, started and stopped in a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, or was it just going on forever? Had, it, had the universe been inflating for essentially an infinite period of time, and all we actually see observationally is the last little bit of inflation and then the kind of hot big bang as it's referred to. So we actually do not know now, you know, in some sense, the, the big bang, the idea of the big bang gave the universe a beginning and that was why it was controversial in the mid 20th century. A lot of people didn't like the idea of the beginning, but inflation in some sense has taken that away. And it says, well, maybe that was the beginning, but maybe not. Maybe it was just the next stage of evolution of some rapidly expanding universe that had been expanding forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah, it's like Fred Hoyle derisively giving the Big Bang its name. You mm. know, it was a joke. But then again, as to a lay person, what you've just described implies that this all, this from an infinite, theoretically from infinitesimal, infinitely dense particle, if you will, because it's hard to use the words, you know, and someone who's not smart like me. So, but it, it implies that it had to happen within something. So these are the mm -hmm. questions you ask when you're a kid or when you wake up in the morning and you go, what the hell is this? 
or you're in your dorm room at three o'clock in the morning in an altered state of consciousness. So yes, so just out of thin air then, again, no pun intended, uh, what did this happen within? What are the, what, what are the theories of that? And then you go yeah, to level, I'm, two, level two, level three, level four, the multiverse. Well, I mean, this is, this is the thing that's very hard to get your head around, but it doesn't require anything to, the universe doesn't expand into something. It's just expanding. So it's what we mean by cosmic expansion is literally that, you know, this point here and this point here are getting further away. And, you know, this point here and this point here are also getting further away. So every bit of space everywhere is getting bigger. In, there is no center to it. It is not, it didn't begin as a point. This is kind of the misleading thing. It's like, it's more that the space time we inhabit was once much smaller, but that there wasn't a single point that it came from. It happened everywhere at the same time. So the whole universe underwent the big bang at the same moment and space expanded very rapidly. Now that is a very hard thing to, to picture. In fact, we can't really picture it because the idea of a three-dimensional expanding space is just, you know, it fries your brain and I can't picture it either. <laughs> but it's, it, but I mean, the, the sort of, there's an analogy that's often used to try and explain the expansion of space, which is, you know, it's very hard to visualize three dimensions expanding. So let's think about two dimensions expanding. That's a bit easier. So if we take a balloon and we think of the universe as living on the surface of the balloon, so we're now in a two-dimensional universe just on the surface. And then you blow the balloon up. And I actually did this in a lecture last Wednesday when I was trying to explain this. You draw little galaxies on the balloon, you blow it up. And as that balloon inflates, every point on that balloon gets further apart from every other point. And that kind of, in some sense, that's a useful analogy for what's happening. But what isn't useful about that analogy is that balloon is expanding into a three-dimensional space. We can see it. It's filling up the room, essentially. But that is not what the universe is like. The, this three-dimensional universe that we live in is not expanding into some higher dimensional space, as far as we know, or at least the theory doesn't require that. It just is expanding. So you don't require, you know, there's no center to it like there is a center to a balloon, which is maybe a sort of unsatisfying answer because it sort of goes against our intuition. But that really is how the, how the observations and the theory is what they, what they tell us, essentially. So it's not... It's not expanding into anything. It's just the universe is growing at every point, everywhere, and it doesn't require some extra space to go into. It's making more space in the in the process, essentially. One of the ways I've always liked or felt was right is that we're just, no matter where we are, we're always in the middle. We're in the middle of space. We're in the middle of time. We have an, we're infinite in all directions. So no matter where we find ourselves, we're always in the middle. So, mm. so I have my, I'm old. I have like another, my shelf life is another 10 years max. Well, but everyone lives to 81 now. We, you know, our, <laughs> our, all of our government leaders are 81. Why, and Mick Jagger's 81. Why, why are they yeah, still- you're just, you're just at the start of your career. You, you could be president of the United States in you know 15 years. <laughs> oh, but, okay. So it's like, I'm swimming along in this fluid and then I pop up for the, that 80 years. I look around, I go, oh, this is interesting. And before I can even say this is interesting, I'm back down in this never ending fluid. And I'm always in the middle. Wherever I pop up, I'm always in the middle, especially if I keep popping up, which is what you guys say. I are, I've already popped up an infinite number of times. And you and I are talking in a different universe where he's Stan is somewhere else or he's picking up a different book. But that's what you're saying, right? I think, are you? Well, I mean, there's two different things there. I think you're, you're kind of talking about the idea of the universe having a center, but also this idea of the multiverse. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, maybe, yeah, but I mean, well, maybe let's take the first one first, because that's quite interesting. Because, you know, that was obviously the, the, the debate that, you know, kickstarted the scientific revolution in some sense. There's an argument about whether the earth was the center of the universe. And we realized, you know, no, it's not, the sun is, and then later, not the sun, the middle of the Milky Way, and now actually the Milky Way is not important either, there are loads of galaxies. So we've kind of been relegated to every step through history to a less and less significant point. But one of the funny things about the expansion of the universe is it actually returns us to the center of the universe in some sense, because, because of this expansion of space, when we look into the universe, what we see is this sphere surrounding us. And if we look far enough in every direction, what we eventually see is the fireball of the Big Bang, because you're looking backwards in time as you look outwards through the universe because light takes time to reach us. And there is actually this spherical boundary that surrounds us in every direction 
uh, which is essentially, it's known as the cosmic horizon. It's the point at which um, space is expanding away from us at the speed of light. And that means that, say, a star at that point, the light from that star will never reach us because it's the light is trying to get to us at the speed of light, but space is moving away from us at the speed of light, so it doesn't get to us ever. So there is actually a finite boundary to what we call the observable universe that's set by the expansion of space. And we are in the middle of that. And wherever you are, actually, in the universe, you are at the center of your own patch of the observable universe. Of course, that doesn't mean, you know, we, there is something beyond that barrier, but we just can't access it. So we're not really in the center, but from our perspective, we, we are in some genuinely sort of true sense, I suppose. Um, but you're, on your point about, you know, this idea that we've had this conversation in a number of times <laughs> in subtly different situations. I mean, it depends. I think the multiverse is, a, a, there's lots of different flavors of multiverse out there and it's an interesting idea and it's kind of a fun idea to think about but for some of the reasons you you say you know this is fun to think that you know we've had this conversation and for, well i don't know it slightly makes the podcast rather meaningless if we've done, if we've had an infinite number of these conversations but um but on the other hand i think as an experimental scientist i have a bit of a problem with the multiverse which is that it's not particularly useful in the sense that it's very hard to test and usually completely untestable it's a kind of it's a logical idea, but there's no, generally speaking, there's no way of proving or disproving it. And as a result, it's not that useful because it, it kind of ends up in the same category as other kinds of things that we might have faith or belief in, such as the existence of God. You know, God cannot, the existence of God cannot be disproven scientifically because, you know, you can always say, well, God just doesn't show up in the universe for whatever reason. The same is true of the multiverse. You know, you can't disprove the multiverse because, you know, if you don't see it, that doesn't mean it's not there. It's just beyond the limits of our ability to observe. So as a result, it's not really, I think, a, a truly scientific idea. And the danger with the multiverse is that it's a sort of ready-made solution to lots of problems, such as, you know, there are these fine-tuning problems in the laws of physics where we see that constants of nature have very peculiar values that appear to be set just right to allow atoms and structure and living things to exist in the universe. And... If we accept the multiverse as an explanation, we could just go, oh, well, you know, things are the way they are because it happened that way by dumb luck. And there's lots of other universes where the conditions are different. And it kind of stops us then looking for answers to the, the way the universe is as we find it. So I don't have it's, it's a fun thing. It's a fun idea to talk about. And it's fun to write popular science books about. But actually, I don't have that much time for it because it doesn't really move the conversation forward very much as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but you know, this non-falsifiability concept, which scientists say, if it's non-falsifiable, let's not even talk about it. But then mm -hmm. you take string theory, for example, it's non-falsifiable, but is there really anything going on that experimentally is going to, you know? Well, I mean, I think the thing about string theory, yeah, it's not, I think some people would argue it's not scientific yet. I mean, it, it has a, it has not yet made any testable predictions. That doesn't mean it's not valuable. It's certainly valuable. It's a it's an avenue that should certainly be explored and continue to be explored. But you know, you would I, I think most string theorists would say they hope at some point string theory will make predictions about the real world that we can then do experiments and test. And and that's when it becomes really interesting. But that doesn't mean you don't develop a theory. You know, you still have to develop your ideas up to that point. But at this point, you know, if you go to you know when I go to a physics conference, particle physics conference. There are no string theorists at those conferences because we have nothing to say to each other. The experimental world has nothing to say to the string theory world and vice versa. Well, there are some very limited cases where there's some interaction, but that's where string theory is being applied to the physics of quarks and gluons rather than quantum gravity, which is what it's really supposed to be about. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's probably not, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's unscientific, but it's perhaps at the moment from an empirical point of view, not particularly interesting, but I hope it will become more interesting in the future or some other approach to, you know, quantum gravity will become interesting because it will start to say, if you do this experiment, you will see this. Um, but until that happens, you know, I'm well, not going like, to get too excited. It's like what you just said about the circumstancing, all the circumstances, the myriad circumstances that have to exist in order for us to be having this podcast. Hmm. You know, maybe the largest is why didn't matter and antimatter just annihilate and we're living in a lifeless universe or simply is why does ice float i mean if ice didn't float we wouldn't be having the mm. podcast. and so therefore mm. it seems to imply that there is a likelihood that there are all these lifeless universes 
because we're only able to discuss this because we are observers. We wouldn't be observers otherwise. Mm. Right? Perhaps, but that sort of implies that there is, if for that hypothesis to be right, there has to be a, a sort of possible set of choices of the laws of physics. And it's not clear that that's true, actually. So one of the sort of, I don't know, what's the word, sleight of hands that's carried out by people who talk about the multiverse is they say, oh, there are many universes and they all have different laws of physics and they're all different. And, you know, ours is special because it just randomly ended up with the right conditions. But hang on a sec, like, how do you get a universe with different laws of physics? How does that work? And a lot of the time there isn't a good answer to that question. So, I mean, it seems that as far as we can tell, the, the, the fields and particles in this universe are fixed. It's not, you don't have, you can't do an experiment where you change, you know, what the particle content of the universe is or change the laws of physics. If you think that there's a way of a multiverse giving rise to lots of different universes with different fundamental constants, there needs to be some mechanism for that to happen. And we don't know of any such mechanism. So I think, you know, that's sort of, I mean, that would be an, that would be a discovery if you found it was possible to sort of alter the basic setup of the fun, of fundamental physics somehow in the lab and we go, oh, okay, well, maybe there is a set of choices that you can make. But it seems that the vacuum that we live in, in other words, the set of quantum fields that exist in space that give rise to matter there isn't really a choice. It's they just are as they are. And what we are trying to understand in physics is why are they as they are? You know, how, why is this particular, is there some kind of deep principle that says you have to have an electron and neutrinos and quarks and these forces, or is actually there, a, is there a possibility of some choice? Is there some process that gave rise to those, you know, set of particles? We don't know the answer to that yet. So I think until we kind of have a better idea, about that it's sort of premature to talk about multiverses and anthropic arguments and all this sort of stuff well, let me throw another one at you because i like doing this because i can ask you anything and i feel like it's much more likely that you could provide me information that i don't already have so look everything we're doing is done by this wetware here so everything is here so the tool that you're trying to study essentially is the very tool that you're using to study it. And it seems kind of difficult to do that. And then if you apply Occam's razor to it, although you would probably disagree, it seems to me as a layman that you guys are juggling an infinite number of balls constantly. Whereas the simplest thing would be, I am the universe. Mm -hmm. And it is falsifiable because you're sitting there and you can say, no, I'm the universe. So he's wrong. But if, we lived in a solipsistic universe, then one of us is here and the other isn't. I have no idea whether you're sentient or not, but yeah. I do know that I am. And therefore, and I've asked this to everybody and they always just ignore the question because it's, it screws up everything they do in their life. <laughs> but, but what if, why not? I mean, there, you don't have to make any assumptions. There are no assumptions. It's the simplest possible solution. Hmm. I am the universe. Hmm. somewhat narcissistic well actually completely yeah. narcissistic but you and everyone would say well it's not falsifiable so let's not even talk about it but it is because you are yeah. the arbiter of it i mean i mean it's in some sense it's true right we all can only experience the universe from our own perspective so in some sense the universe is us for everyone i mean well if you believe that everyone else is conscious but maybe 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 they're just illusions i mean i don't know is the answer i suppose it's a, it's it's an it, it's an idea, but it, is it an explanation? Does it really explain anything to say I am the universe? It doesn't explain why the universe, as you encounter it, is as it is. Presumably, you could have been a very a multiple a, a range of different possible universes. So why are you this one? You know this particular one and that you inhabit. It's the same question that you're looking for. My question would be, well, why am I the universe? And you're saying, why is the universe the universe? Hmm. The same question. It's yeah, but it depends on the question. You know, I, I don't know how you would frame that question in a in a sign. Yeah, I suppose this is coming back to your people the way people have dismissed your argument, dismissed this question before. It's like, well, fine, but how do what what's the kind of consequence of this point of view? You know, how do we make progress in understanding, or how do you make progress if you're the universe? How do you make progress in understanding the world around you based on this idea? And it's not clear to me that you would make different choices than you would if you assume everyone in the universe is a conscious being made of particles, you know. 
So it's more sort of philosophical than scientific, I, I guess. Well, that's the thing is, you know, remember when, uh, I don't know if you remember when the Dalai Lama would meet with particle physicists every year and Buddhism and particle physics, physics began to merge in a certain sense. I don't know. I guess he's not in as good a shape as he was, but I think every year he did do that and things seemed to merge. I guess it also goes towards, do you believe that the universe is tending towards something in the same of, in the same concept or aspect of purposeful activity? Mm. I, I tend to not think, well, I don't, I suppose the answer is I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think there's any evidence the universe has a purpose. I mean, I think it was um, Weinberg who said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. I, th I think that's, I think that's Weinberg. I'm not misattributing that, but um, maybe check that one. <laughs> but I, I think, yeah, there's no evidence of purpose in the universe, I would say. Um, it's tending towards something as far as we can tell, which is heat death. So, you know, in, in untold trillions upon trillions of years, we think the universe will end up as this, formless black void with nothing in it at all um but i mean there's some interesting ideas about that you know roger penrose has this idea that the end state of the universe this infinite blackness of nothing cut freezing nothingness is actually indistinguishable in what conformally which means to do with scale basically it looks the same as the hot big bang so he has this idea that the end state of the universe gives rise to another universe that's a kind of nice idea. I suppose it's slightly nicer than just the idea of infinite darkness forever. <laughs> um, but as it, in terms of purpose, I mean, you know, I think science doesn't tell us anything about that at the moment. You know, that doesn't mean, I mean, there's all these ideas around, you know, do we live in a simulation? I mean, well, maybe, who knows? Uh, but as far as I can see, there is no purpose to the universe, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't find purpose in it, that, you know, we, it's extraordinary, as you say, that we are here, that we get to look out at this, amazing place and ask questions and try and figure things out and i think that has meaning whether or not the universe itself cares in in some sense or has any bigger bigger sort of design behind it what about i mean a lot of the science fiction that you and i read when we were kids is now science fact or or even more so like when when tech when i guess his second book about artificial intelligence because maybe he didn't think another physics book would work um but he was and that was only like a few years ago, and he was way far behind on what ChatGPT is doing now, or the mm -hmm. idea of a of an AGI. You know, people now saying it was you know what it would never happen. It'll happen in decades. Now it's going to happen in five years, and all these things. Like one of the old one was you know the idea of a black hole in this universe emerging as a white hole in another. You know, that kind of thing. It's like. And I don't really know what I'm asking. It's just that these are questions that I'm looking to you for answers and you can't answer them. No, well, I, I am only, you know, an experimental particle physicist. So I'm not a theoretical physicist. I'm not an expert in machine learning or AI. So, I mean, I'm not sure I can say anything that, it, certainly nothing that's more sort of well argued or thought through than something you would have read by Max Tedmark or someone else like that. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't give you any answers to black holes or white holes either. The only reason I'm, I, I bring him up at, or Brian is because they're all associated with CERN and, mm. and they write books, popular science books for me to read. And then that, that's the last one I read. So it just is in my mind right mm. now. Mm. You, mm. But you guys do that. What? Yeah. Okay. So like you, you write this book, you send it out to me. I, I read it. And then what's really good about it your book and others like it is that when I close the cover, I'm still thinking, you know, mm. and it, it, I, when I reach the end of the book, I haven't reached the end of the book at all because mm. there's so much more I can think about and so much more I can look at. So what do you want? Because you're going from something that's so difficult to understand and yet you're trying to explain it to me, what do you want me to take away? I mean, you're talking about a, a, a muon neutrino there's only so much I can, I can understand that because I'm not you. So what do you expect me to, what do you want me to take away from this? I think exactly what you've just said, which is this, you know, the, the reason people read popular science, I don't think it's because they necessarily want an education. I mean, they, you hopefully learn something, but actually, I don't know about you, but when I read a book, 
if you ask me, if you quiz me on it six months later, the amount I would actually have retained would be pretty minimal, I think. But it's, it's more about that stimulation of curiosity and, and that desire to learn more. And, and as you say, it shouldn't be the end of a journey. It should be the beginning of one. I mean, in terms of what I was trying to do with the book, I suppose, I was trying to do a couple of things. One is just tell what I thought, what I, a story that I'd been living for 10 years, which was this exciting period of these anomalies cropping up in physics. And I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of what it's like to be you know, working in at the cutting edge of physics when these potential discoveries are arising. And I think give people a bit of a sense of why do physicists get out of bed in the morning? What, why do they do what they do? These sort of spend years of their lives spent, you know, fiddling over some little detail of an experiment just so they can measure some quantity to an extra couple of decimal places, which seems like a very odd way to spend your life. Um, and I was trying to sort of, I wanted to get some of that across. I think a lot of, I think what, what some what in, in popular science writing, I think there's a tendency towards theoretical physicists, I think. So a lot of the most famous writers tend to be theoreticians and they talk about the sorts of things you're talking about, like white holes and black holes and, you know, multiverses and AI and all this sort of stuff, which is all very sexy sounding. But I think there's a, another half of the story which doesn't get as much attention, which is actually where the bulk of science is done, which is people with machines trying to sort of scratch some new bit of knowledge out of nature, essentially. And I wanted to sort of tell that side of the story as well and sort of show, you know, science doesn't just progress or make progress by geniuses like Einstein or Hawking who sit there and they think these amazing truths up about the universe by sheer power of thought that actually a lot of most of what we know about the universe didn't come from that kind of work. It came from teams of people working together, perfecting some instrument that allowed them to you know, make new discoveries eventually after this long period of hard work. And I think that, that that's a kind of story I think that doesn't get uh, doesn't get told enough, I think. And that was also partly what I was trying to do. So it's this excitement of, you know, what is it like to try and make a discovery, but also what is science really like at the end of the day and why do people do it? If you went back and looked at a transcript of this podcast, you probably have used the word excitement like six times. And I wonder mm -hmm. how it is that you still have this sense of excitement and this passion that comes through obviously in the way you speak about it. What is it that gives you that? It's a good question. I think it's, <laughs> it's a kind of, it's curiosity, I think. I mean, part of the reason that I, you know, the first book I wrote, How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch, in some sense that was, in some sense it was an explanation of why I find physics exciting. And I think it's, is, physics is not a collection of, it's not an, a set of established facts. It's not about, you know, there are this many particles, they interact this way. For me, physics is this process of discovery. It's what Feynman called the pleasure of finding things out, right? That's why we do science. It's not about knowing necessarily. Well, it's, it's partly about knowing, but it's about the process of finding out. And actually the, that first book is really about how we went from knowing more or less nothing, <laughs> or we knew about some, some materials on earth to you know, being able to sort of peer back to the first moments of the Big Bang and really understand the fundamental building blocks of the universe, their origins. And it's that story that when you follow the scientists through, the, through history and you see how they solve problems, that's what I think is that's what's exciting. There's moments where there's a breakthrough and you kind of see a new view of the universe. And, you know, as an experimental physicist, I'm one person amongst thousands, you know, and my contribution is just a little bit on top of the huge pile of, you know, accumulated work that's been done. But even to make a tiny contribution is exciting because you're part of that long story that began, you know, thousands of years ago and will hopefully carry on, you know, into the future and who knows where it's going to lead. But the idea that you can contribute to that story of progress is exciting. And I think science is one of those areas, maybe one of the very few areas in human endeavor where there is genuine progress. I think, you know, you have people that like to argue our progress is it's just fashion you know ideas come and go that's not what science isn't like that science makes progress you know the theories we have now and the knowledge we have now is better than it was in the past it's not just that fashions have changed you know we can do things now we couldn't do 200 years ago and that's for me what makes science so exciting you can by this iterative process of hypothesis testing you can go forward and you can build on knowledge and you can get to a deeper understanding and i just hope we can carry on doing that and that why is why I get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, it's I get out of bed thinking the same things you do, but then that's the end. <laughs> I, <laughs> wait, what the hell is this? And then that's pretty much my day. <laughs> but yeah. a couple of things are like it's like, you know, you hearken back 
to find it over and over again in his book, Confessions of a Curious Mind. He says, you don't have to be a genius. You have to be curious and a really hard worker. But then, you know, you got a guy who, who said that, you know, he's half genius, half buffoon. Uh, mm, yeah. Uh, was it Freeman Dyson? I can't quite remember. But yes, I know, I know the quote. Yeah. But, but, and the one thing I haven't gotten to, which is the, probably the most important in your life, what well, is the most important in your life is your experiment and why it's the beauty quark and what you're trying to figure out using mm -hmm. the vast technological resources you have access to. Yeah, well, so yeah, the experiment I work on is called LHCB, which is one of four big detectors on the Large Hadron Collider. So there's a huge 27 kilometer ring. There are four places on that ring where we collide protons with each other and we have these big detectors that record what happens so there's four of them my one's called L I say my one I, I work as part of a team of 1400 people on this experiment called LHCB and the B as you said stands for beauty which is a name for one of the six quarks so a quark is a fundamental particle that make up the nuclei of atoms so protons and neutrons in the nucleus are made of quarks they're made of up and down quarks but there are four others that don't exist in the universe normally, but we can create them briefly in experiments before they decay. The beauty quark is also sometimes called the bottom quark. It's the, it's the second heaviest of the quarks. And the reason it's really interesting is because, because it's heavy and it's unstable. It, so you make one of these things in a collision, it will live for about one and a half trillionths of a second, and then it will decay. And because it's heavy, it can decay into a huge range of different particles so there's hundreds of different possible decays and the rate of these decays are predicted by this theory we've been discussing the standard model and because this is a heavy particle and it's exotic the way it behaves the way it decays can be strongly influenced by the existence of new forces of nature new fundamental particles that we've not seen before so Broadly speaking, what my colleagues on LHCB do is we make lots and lots and lots of measurements of these beauty quarks, different decays, different processes. And we look for places where our experiments deviate from the theory, because it, when that happens, that can be the clue to something we've never seen before that's affecting these beauty quarks at some tiny distance. So some very, very, so for example, you have a fifth force of nature that just pulls on these beauty quarks in a particular way that when they decay, the particles that come out don't quite come out at the same rate you'd expect, or they come out at different angles. Or maybe you see decays you don't expect to see at all actually happening because they're being allowed to happen by some new interaction that we didn't know existed. So that is broadly what we do. And um, in the last decade or so, there have been a whole set of anomalies that have appeared in these beauty quark decays and some of them have got stronger some of them have disappeared but the thing that's very interesting about this is it, it could be these various anomalies the outline of some new theory essentially we could be seeing the edges of some new discovery and we we don't really know yet so we we don't have yet enough data and we don't have good enough theoretical predictions to be confident but it's a very promising area and we hope in the next few years that some of these anomalies will turn into bona fide, you know, discoveries of something. And that will be one of the first clues we've had in a long time, if it happens, to what comes beyond the standard model, be that new forces, dark matter, you name it. So that's why that's why they're interesting. That's why it's exciting. And that's so I spend most of my days uh, when I'm not doing this sort of thing analyzing the data that we that gets produced in the experiment and searching for you i'm particularly interested in extremely rare decays so these are decays that only happen you know one beauty quark in a million or less will decay in these particular ways so you're kind of panning for these very small fragments of gold in a big data set making these measurements and then seeing if they agree with what you expect from the the theory that one thing i i listened to that you said was about how the more powerful the magnet you can make, the smaller the circumference your ring mm -hmm. will be. The, the less powerful ones, the larger the circumference has to be to reach 99.9999912 yeah. of the speed of light. So if you build either a larger one or one that has stronger magnets and you get another nine, would you be able to do more and is that ever going to happen yeah i mean this is the big debate that's happening at the moment uh, in particle physics generally in europe in america in china japan is about you know what comes after the lhc and 
the history of particle physics has been this process of gigantification. So, you know, you started off, Ernest Lawrence had built the first ever uh, uh, cyclotron back in the 30s. It was a few inches across, and this sent particles around in a little ring, and you, it was a great discovery. It was really powerful. Um, and then they got bigger, you got things that were hundreds of meters across, then kilometers, and now the LHC, which is the biggest in the world, which is 27 kilometers circumference. Uh, and as you say, the limit to basically the reason they're so big is you want the, high, the higher the energy that you can get in the collision, the more the heavier the particles you can make. So particles have different masses. And in order to create one of these things, you have to put in enough energy to basically make the uh, quantum field that it lives in wobble so the particle appears. So that's what happened with the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is very heavy. You need a big collider to make one of these things, basically, as a result. So if we want to find out what lives beyond the Higgs, what lives at higher energies, we either need to, as you say, have more powerful magnets, cleverer ways of accelerating, or we need to make the rings bigger. And actually, the proposals generally do both. So they're, we're going to make it bigger, and we're going to make the magnets much stronger. And that way, we don't just scale the energy by the size of the ring. We get an extra boost on top of that. So CERN is working on a, you know, a, a big long-term project at the moment called the Future Circular Collider, which is a proposal for a 90 kilometer ring that would basically be the biggest thing you could fit in the Geneva area because it kind of would be underneath Lake Geneva in between the Alps and the Jura Mountains in this kind of basin. You can't make it any bigger because then you're like drilling through mountainous rock, which becomes very, very difficult. Um, and the idea is you improve the magnet technology and the idea of doing this is basically well, there's two there's two reasons. The first there's two machines that's really being proposed. One which would be a, what's called a Higgs factory, that will make lots of Higgs bosons, and its job primarily will be to study the Higgs, put it under the microscope, and try and figure out if this really weird thing that we've discovered really is the Higgs we expect, or if it's something different. Maybe it has properties we didn't expect. So that would be the first version. Way way in the future, 2070s. We're now talking you would have a proton-proton collider like the LHC, which would get to energies seven or eight times higher than the LHC. And that would allow us to discover, explore basically the micro world at much higher energies and hopefully discover new stuff. So it's a very, very long-term project. Um, we're talking basically 50 years or more to, to kind of get the whole science program delivered. And as to whether it happens, I think it's, what is currently being sort of figured out internationally is that, you know, do we build the CERN project? There is another project that could be built in Japan. The US is now particularly enthusiastic about something called a muon collider, which is a kind of revolutionary new type of machine that would accelerate muons instead of electrons or protons. But there are lots of technical difficulties with doing that. If you could do that, though, you could make a smaller ring. The idea is you could build it more affordably on a shorter time scale. But there's a lot of technological challenges that need to be solved. So the answer is, I think, you know, these machines will only be built internationally. No nation can afford to build them on their own. So the, the global community of physicists, I think, will have to probably coalesce around one or maybe two of these projects and then really make the case to the, the public and to governments as to why we need to carry on exploring the universe at the shortest distances if we want to ultimately understand what it's all about essentially so i mean as to whether it happens i really hope it happens because i think if we don't get the next machine we will be giving up on essentially progress in fundamental physics until until we sort of have some massive technological breakthrough that allows us to do these on a smaller scale and the danger is if a field withers on the vine because there's no new data you know it's very hard to restart so i hope that it gets funded but it's obviously you know the logistical challenges the the political challenges, the financial challenges are enormous that have to be overcome. But, you know, we've done it before with the LHC, so hopefully it can be done again, but we'll have to see. Just think if there were practical implications, you could get the money tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, the money isn't really, I mean, okay, the, the, the sums involved are large. It's going to cost a trillion dollars. It's going to cost, I mean, you know, tens of billions. So the first iteration, you know, 10 billion ish, a bit, little bit more dollars. So which is expensive for a science project, but in the global, in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, um, Elon Musk could pay for it out of his back pocket, yeah. you know, very easily if he, if, he, if he decided he wanted to get into particle physics. But, you know, it, you compare it to say the Apollo program. I mean, that this, this machine would be in, in, you know, if you, if you take the Apollo program's cost in today's money, we're talking a tenth the cost of the Apollo program. So it's not, and we're talking about a half a century of science, 
you know, that you're going to get out of this thing. So it's not something that happens one year. It's going to be decades of, you know, discovery and work and, and et cetera. And that's why, and shared internationally, these costs become much more manageable. So actually, like, I think the cost to the UK taxpayer of CERN at the moment is around about three dollars, two and a half dollars a year, something like that. So that's for the Higgs and all the other stuff that we do. So it's really a tiny amount of government expenditure. But obviously, there are lots of things competing for funding. So it's a question of priorities and resources and all the rest of it. But I think there's a very strong case. And it's just, you know, we have to make the case, as you say, though, actually, you know, we often we talk quite often about spin off technologies from these projects. So CERN historically has given us the World Wide Web invented by Tim Berners Lee given away for nothing. The magnet technology that we use in MRI machines that is used increasingly in proton cancer therapy came out of particle physics. So you have all these spin off technologies that are very useful. But actually, the other thing you shouldn't ignore is the possibility that the fundamental knowledge itself has applications. And that is much harder to foresee. And a good example of this historically is um, in 1932 at the Cavendish in Cambridge, where I work, Ernest Rutherford and his team split the atom with one of the first particle accelerators. And they measured for the first time, they proved Einstein's equation equals MC squared. They got energy out of this process. And newspaper journalists said to Rutherford, you know, Lord Rutherford, you know, could we now get energy out of the nucleus? This is going to be a new, bold, exciting age of unlimited energy. And Rutherford said, nonsense, you know, we're never going to get energy out of the nucleus. There's moonshine. You know, the experiments are far too complicated. And within a decade and a half, he's proven spectacularly wrong. You have the atomic bomb, you have nuclear fission uh, power stations and so on. So even the scientists leading their field often cannot foresee the consequences of their work. And I think at the moment, it's very hard to know or see what the applications of, say, the Higgs boson might be. But that doesn't mean that in 20, 50, 100 years, the, the, you could have some really revolutionary new technology. And generally speaking, the biggest step forwards in you know, technology have come often from fundamental science that has an unpredictable application sometime after the discovery itself is made. So I wouldn't rule that out either. And that is part of the reason why you do these kinds of experiments, because there is always the promise that you might, maybe, if you're lucky, uh, come across some new technology that will have really radical implications. It's interesting, and I, I know you don't take this for granted, but no one should take for granted that you guys have the luxury of being able to stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is like with Rutherford, which is really cool and noble, scientists are really glad to be proved, generally, to be proven they were wrong, that they made a mistake that they love mistakes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, science is all about being proven wrong. That's why you do it. You want to find out where your your understanding breaks down. It's interesting. I was talking to someone about this the other day, and I think there's a kind of, it's perhaps where there's some job, some work to be done in the public understanding of science. This idea that science is, you know, it's not, it's, it's not about authority and this is the truth. It's about this is our best understanding of what's going on at the moment based on this evidence. But we are ready, more than ready to revise this when we get new evidence that contradicts it. And so during COVID, one of the problems, I think, was that, you know, people were given certain advice early on, you know, wash your hands or whatever, because at that point, people thought, well, maybe this is something you pick up on surfaces. And then a month or two later, people say, well, actually, no, it's mostly about aerosol breathing it in, you need to wear face masks. And people were, well, you've changed your mind. You don't know what you're talking about, you know. <laughs> and, and politicians, you know, are very reluctant to make U-turns because they, they don't like to be seen to change their mind because it makes them look weak. But in science, changing your mind is a sense of strength that means you're actually following the evidence. And I think but that can lead people to sort of, you know, mistrust science because perhaps there's not an understanding of actually, you know, science isn't, you know, when you're in school, it's kind of delivered to you as an established body of knowledge. But that's not really what it is. It's an evolving process where we learn more and we revise and we change our hypotheses. And maybe that's an area where we need to communicate a bit better, I think. But hopefully, you know, Space Oddities, the book does that a little bit because it's all about being on the frontiers of knowledge where you, you're making mistakes, you're changing your ideas constantly as you grope your way <laughs> towards a, a better understanding of the world. Yeah, and you guys vet yourself. I mean, everything's peer reviewed because the other team wants to find out why you, that you were wrong. <laughs> That you were yeah, wrong, which is great. Exactly. It goes yeah. towards progress. But um, what was I going to say as we close down? Because I've been talking too much. Um, well, yeah, okay. One last thing. Okay. I understand of the four forces, gravity is by far, you guys love talking about billions and trillions. So it's trillion times weaker than the weak nuclear force. 
but you don't, it's like it's the redheaded stepchild. You never really paid any attention except when it sneaks in on the sterile neutrino thing. But gravity, mm -hmm. and then, then you're looking for a graviton. It's like, can how can you have it both ways? Gravity is in there somewhere. I mean, it's part of the, the big standard model. Mm -hmm. Why is it not? I mean, why you know, you use it. Well, I mean, it's not that we don't use it. I mean, gravity that, you know, we, there's actually in the book, I talk about these two standard models, the standard model of particle physics, the very small, the standard model of cosmology, the very big, and the standard model of cosmology is all about gravity, basically, it's a theory of gravity, or gravitational theory, and how matter and radiation and dark energy and gravity work together, or, you know, and to shape the universe. But, you know, when it comes to particle physics, it's not that we just ignore it, it's that you can't measure it, you know, the, the forces, as you say, it, the quantum forces that we know about the weak and the strong and the electromagnetic force are so much stronger than gravity that in any particle physics experiment we do they completely overwhelm gravity so that you have no chance of measuring a gravitational effect in a particle physics experiment broadly speaking so yeah i mean people think there may be things called gravitons you know particles of gravitation in some sense but they are so feeble that you know it's very hard to think cook up experiments where you would see such a thing now you know there are corollaries to that the lhc back in the early days a lot of the, there are a lot of theories that predicted gravitons that had a large mass so certain theories that had extra dimensions of space so extra directions that you can move in and i invite you to try and imagine what that is like i have no idea but some of these theories predicted you get gravitons that you would see in the collider so there are some cases where you might see these things in very exotic theories but in if you just take general relativity as it is and you know our understanding of quantum mechanics gravitons were only really become apparent in a collider experiment say where you have a collider that is energetic enough to reach what we call the Planck scale, which is this vast energy scale, far, far, far higher than we can reach at the LHC. I mean, with current technology to build such a collider, you would need it to be the size of the Milky Way. So we're talking vast energies, which we never we, we will not conceivably be able to access, you know, I think for the foreseeable future. So for now, and that's the frustration, I think, of, of gravity and quantum mechanics, that <clears throat> the places where quantum gravity may appear tend to be in these really extreme environments. So either the moment of the Big Bang, the center of black holes, or in these hypothetical gigantic collider experiments that we can't actually do. And, and essentially that nature seems to sort of make it very, very difficult for us to study this thing. So it's not that we ignore it. I mean, we'd love to find a quantum theory of gravity, but the problem is nature's rather unkind to us. And it you know basically says, you can't really know anything about this. Well, so this, this has been wonderful. Like I always think about my podcast and I think, well, hopefully a lot of people will listen to it, but if they don't, I would, I would be just as happy to have just been talking to you with no one else listening because I would have paid you for it. It's better than paying for a therapy, especially if I want to, <laughs> if I want to get rid of my solipsistic ideas, which is, I guess, psychopathic. <laughs> <laughs> Right? I've never I've never been described as a therapist before, so thank you. That's very well, actually, kind. if you think about it, it almost kind of is. I mean, hmm. you are changing. You, you you do attempt to change. I don't know. What is it? What is a psychiatrist if he's attending? What what did Freud try to do in analysis? If you think if you think of it as a science, what was the whole point to cure you of something? To cure you of your hmm. ignorance? I mean, not in a bad way. But. Well, change, change the way you look at something, perhaps. I, I don't yeah. know, but yeah. Anyway, I can ramble now forever, but I, this will, <laughs> we are at the end. And thank you so much for uh, doing this. I really appreciate it. it was I know. Well, thank you so much. It was, it was really great talking to you. Really good fun. Yeah, likewise. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.